Operation Pastorius, the failed Nazi spy ring in America. The plan for the Nazi spy ring, Operation Pastorius, was in itself fairly simple. Eight men divided into two teams of four were to land along America's coast and coordinate a series of sabotage operations using incendiary devices. The main end goal was to destroy the Pennsylvania Railroad Station in Newark, New Jersey, the Hellgate Bridge in New York, and locks in St. Louis and Cincinnati. But thanks to one of the spies, the whole plan was scuppered before it ever really began. Operation Pastorius was another of Hitler's attempts to build a spy network that could infiltrate America from the inside. A dramatic earlier attempt met its downfall the previous summer in 1941, after all of its principal agents were arrested by the FBI. Operation Pastorius began a year later in the summer of 1942 after Pearl Harbor, but it had even less success than its predecessor, resulting in the end of Hitler's subversive designs in America. The eight men who made up the spies were all German-born men who had spent a large period in America. George John Dash, Ernest Berger, Edward John Curling, Herbert Haupt, Richard Quirin, Heinrich Harm Heink, Hermann Otto Neubauer, and Werner Thiel spent two months in spy school on a farm before the mission began in May 1942. Lieutenant Walter Kappa, a Nazi intelligence officer who chose the men based on their English ability, devotion to Nazism, and their perceived desire to be saboteurs, ran the operation. The leader of the first team, Edward John Curling, had joined the Nazi party early in 1928 before moving to America and remaining there until the war. He was to take a U-boat and land along the Floridian coastline. The second team was led by George John Dash and consisted of Ernest Berger, Quirin, and Heinck. Each boat was well stocked with forged paperwork, supplies, explosives, wires, fuses, and plenty of US dollars to get the spies through the states to their meeting place in Cincinnati. Landing on a quiet stretch of beach at Amagansett, Long Island on June 13, 1942, the four men dressed in civilian clothing did not expect to be almost immediately confronted by a young U.S. Coast Guard named John Collin. Dash and the others had already received orders to kill anyone who could impact or derail their plan, but instead Dash engaged the young man in conversation, claiming they were fishermen. But Dash's assurances didn't fool Collin, and despite his excellent English, he asked to see the man's paperwork. Instead, Dash gave him the equivalent of a couple months of groceries as hush money and warned him that if he ever wanted to see his family again, he would keep quiet. Colin, realizing his choices were acceptance or death, took the money and promised his silence. Of course, this lasted about five minutes. When he returned to his station, Colin promptly informed his superiors of the strange and suspicious man he had encountered. Dash himself was already starting to turn. He later claimed he had always intended to turn himself over to the FBI, but whether that was entirely true or due to the meeting with Cullen was impossible to say. Either way, Dash sussed long before anyone else that the jig was up. The team split into two pairs to rendezvous in New York City later, and Dash soon approached the one man he thought might be on his side, Ernest Berger. Despite being chosen for the mission, 36-year-old Berger had actually spent some time in Nazi concentration camps after criticizing the occupation of Poland. He was offered a role in Operation Pastorius and took it as a way to escape his imprisonment. All in all, he seemed an interesting choice for a mission that depended on absolute loyalty to the Nazis. Dash, knowing this, waited until the two were alone to approach Berger. It was there he revealed his plans to betray the spy ring. Sure that Colin had already exposed them, Dash told Berger he planned to go to the FBI and speak directly with Director J. Edgar Hoover and tell them everything involved in Operation Pastorius. Berger immediately agreed. Just 30 hours after their initial landing, Dash called the FBI office in New York, calling himself Frank Daniel Pastorius of Germany and announcing he had some important information for J. Edgar Hoover himself. Although he wasn't able to meet or speak to Hoover, an earlier report from John Cullen to the FBI confirmed Dash's identity. He met with federal agents in Washington where he showed them the vast amounts of money he'd been given for the plot and gave them the information of the other group led by Curling, who at that point had yet to land in Florida. Later, Hoover took credit for the whole expose, 
making it sound like efficient work by the FBI who had uncovered the plot, rather than learning of the spy ring thanks to the betrayal of George Dash. Either way, however, thanks to Dash, Curling, Haupt, Neubauer, and Thiel were condemned before they ever even set foot on American soil. Four days after Dash's party had landed, the other half of the Nazi spy ring landed four miles south of Ponte Vedra near Jacksonville. They quickly brought their large waterproof crates containing their explosives onto the shore and buried them in the sand. Taking the money, they headed to downtown Jacksonville. As they traveled up to New York, the men were brazen in flaunting themselves in their secret operation. The youngest in the group, 22-year-old Herbert Haupt, met with both a former girlfriend and another friend, rather foolishly, as both of them later turned him in to the FBI. He connected with family who gave him aid on his journey, and at one point Haupt even waltzed himself into the FBI offices in Chicago to ask if he was under any suspicion. The officers there, aware of the covert plan to follow and arrest the remaining four members of Operation Pastorius, lied, assuring him of his safety. Gradually, all four men were arrested by the FBI. On June 24, Curling, as the leader, was taken back to Jacksonville by federal agents, who instructed him to reveal the burial locations of the explosives, which he soon did. They charged all eight men with violating the 81st and 82nd Articles of War and the sections of the laws of war relating to espionage, sabotage, and conspiracy. The amount of money carried by the men was enough to convince the FBI that this was Hitler's big plan for the states, and one the Nazis were sure of the success of. After their arrest, things moved quickly and with President Franklin D. Roosevelt's personal involvement. On July 1, 1942, it was announced that the trial would take place in a military court rather than a civil one and seven U.S. generals would try the defendants. The choice was deliberate by Roosevelt, who expected the men to receive the death penalty. The trial of the Operation Pastorius spy ring caused some controversy, however. The chosen high-ranking generals had no formal legal training, and seven of the eight spies were given the same two lawyers to work on their defense, something that doesn't usually occur due to potential conflicts. Hitler was reportedly furious. As a result, the case was actually referred to the Supreme Court while it was ongoing. Two days before it ended, the court ruled in the military court's favor, sealing the men's fate. On July 8th, the trial began, in secretive circumstances. Windows were covered and reporters banned with routes to the courtroom changed every day of the three weeks it lasted. Haupt claimed he went along with the plan in fear. Thiel claimed he thought it was just about spreading propaganda and had longed to return to the States. Neubauer said it was a soldier's duty to carry out orders and not to think, and therefore shouldn't be held responsible. Curling, one of Hitler's earliest followers and arguably the staunchest Nazi of all, said nothing. Things were not quite so dire for Dash and Berger as the other six men. Dash received separate legal counsel and the U.S. court acknowledged their role in bringing the spy ring to light. By August 3rd, the trial was over, and the sentence for all eight men had been decided. Death by electrocution. The sentences were carried out promptly, with Haupt being first to face the electric chair. But Dash and Berger got a reprieve. Rather than death, Dash was sentenced to 30 years in a federal prison. Berger's sentence was life. Each served just six years of their prison sentence before President Truman commuted their sentences and deported them to Germany in 1948. Berger later died in anonymity, but Dasha's stench of betrayal followed him throughout the rest of his life until his death in 1991. The great Nazi spy ring had ended, not with a bang, but a whimper.